Welcome, my name is Christian Mifsud. I am Principal Curator for Research and Documentation of Historic Buildings at Heritage Malta. In 2019, the National Library of Malta organized a series of lectures entitled Cities, Harbors and Artifacts, Transformation of an Early Modern Landscape. For that session, I chose to speak on the Valletta Market with a title entitled Of Markets and Melting Pots, Commercial Spaces in Early Modern Valletta. The Valletta Market, located in the heart of the city, was close to the political center of the city. It was also located between the parish of St. Dominic and the parish of St. Paul. So it wasn't only within the social center of the city, but also close to the political center. The study dealt with three main aspects of the, the building. The first one is the actual physical building, the second point was the economic aspect of the building and how it was used and utilized. And the third point was the social aspect. The project started off as an archaeological excavation which took place in 2016-2017 as a follow-up to ongoing restoration works being carried out on the Valletta market. Following up on the archaeological excavations, archival research was also carried out on various local archives, including the Public Works Archives, the Notorial Archives, and also the National Library of Malta, where we could actually recreate the economy of the building. In the earlier period, we don't know if the, the space was actually being used as a Valletta market. During the foundation period, we know, however, that from a study on the properties surrounding the piazza, most of the properties were actually being bought by merchants. Also, there is a study by Professor Gottfried Wettinger and another study by William Zamit, which show that this, the piazza was also used for other activities, including, for example, the markets of slaves and also as part of processions. With the arrival of water in Valletta in 1614, we know that Grandmaster Winyacourt built up the space uh, with a fountain. Comparing the space within this setup with a central fountain to other spaces uh, in cities around Europe, we know that such spaces were actually being used as markets. So it is most probable that this space was also functioning at a market at this stage. We don't have a description of the fountain from this period. However, a slightly later description by Albert Jovan de Rochefort in 1663 gives a very vivid description of the fountain. I quote, in the center of the market square, there is a fountain, which is very convenient for the thirsty people, horses and little dogs. A small obelisk standing on a basin. It has a little basket in which there are flowers and fruits sprayed by thin spouts of water, which emerge from the foot of the obelisk. Underneath it, there is another basin which serves as a drinking trough for horses and finally, further down, there is a small drinking trough high enough to enable a small dog to drink. Up to 1643, this, the square functioned as an open market. However, at this stage, Grandmaster Lascaris decided that as part of a general strategy to build up public spaces, he decided to, to build up the market. In fact, um, the, first, the first proposal was actually approved by the Cancelleria on the 17th of July. And from then on, the, the, the market um, is known to have been built. The first complex included six botteghe located opposite the, the, the Grand Master's Palace, overlooking uh, what today is Mer Merchant Street. The concept, however, we know it was much, much larger. In fact, the proposal was approved under the title of Per abbellir la piazza delle erbe con circondarla di botteghe. This shows that the, the project was much larger. However, we do know that this project later became re a reality. In 1658, we have accounts 
for the actual space being built all around the piazza. We, we know this from uh, the Cabrillo Lascaris, which tells us how the actual space was functioning with, with rents of the tenements and also names of the, of the tenants. It's interesting to note that in this setup, the, the market enclosed all the central space and um, created or rather defined the, the streets around. So we had Strada San Giacomo, which is now St. Merchant Street. It also defined Strada del Salvatore, which is now uh, Old Theatre Street. It also outlined St. Paul Street at the back and also Felix Street, which originally was named Strada Felice. The second part of the study dealt with the uses and the economy of the market. So for this section, most of the information was obtained from the archives in the National Library of Malta. The information was primarily extracted from the Fondazione Lascaris and the Fondazione Cottoner accounts. Um, we have to make it a point that not all the information exists for the whole period. However, the information existing is enough to give us a peek into the social and the economic history of the market. So these contracts, or rather the accounts of the, of the Fondazione, gave us information on primarily four aspects. They gave us the tenement number, so we could actually identify the location. Uh, it also gave the name of the person renting the tenement and sometimes also his profession. So that is very important because it gives you the zoning of the market and finally also the rent amount, which could actually lead us into understanding the, the, the various values of the spaces. I am going to start from the most central element, which is the building itself. The information obtained identified a series of zonings for, for different uses. So, for example, we had Strada Salvatore uh, was primarily rented out by Salumieri, uh, while the internal part on the courtyard, that same, the, the room was divided and rented out with, with uh, greengrocers. We also have Strada San Paolo, which was primarily um, f consisting of six lodges. Of the six lodges, some were also rented out by the, by the Salumieri. On the other side, on Strada Felice, um, we had the uh, fishmongers. We know that the fishmongers were also uh, using this space until the 1800s, when the market was then relocated to the, to the waterfront. It's also interesting to note that most of the time, um, the information obtained about this building is from laws passed to control the use of water. Water was very important, especially to keep fresh the products. The information obtained from the tenements and the profession gave us enough information to, to realize that the market was actually divided into zones. This is, was the first time with, where we could actually identify even these zones. A description from the 1800s, once again from, from Anderson, gives us a, a very colorful picture of the market at the time giving even details of the product being sold. And I quote, when therefore the mixture of quantity of articles such as meat, fowl, fish, fruit and vegetables and the great number of people crowding in to be supplied with some or other of them is considered, it will naturally be expected that there must be, as there certainly is, a considerable failure in point of cleanliness. Here are also many cooks and wine shops where meat, fish and vegetables are dressed and most generally by frying them in oil. 
This gives us another aspect of the market. In fact, the market was not only a shop where you could actually go there, buy the product and go back home. The market was also serving as a place where you could actually eat out. It was prim primarily um, the, same, the same services as a restaurant. Taking a, a slightly wider approach and now starting to look at the, at the rents, we can also recreate some uh, rental trends taking place in commercial spaces. So the study showed us that there are serious uh, factors affecting the rents. However, primarily it, it was the economical value of the space. The exact location the, of, the, of the room rented out by the tenant, um, if the space looked a primary location such as Merchant Street, at that time called uh, Strada San Giacomo, or Strada Salvatore, old theater street today, the prices were even higher than the other parts of the, of the market. This is a very interesting point because although the, these, these mentioned streets had a major uh, footfall uh, from people passing uh, to, to go to the, the main square of Valletta, the, the spaces were also perceived to have um, a major value and because of potentially added revenue. So even if some tenants are renting out spaces overlooking the principal streets, it did not, it did not mean that um, they were going to be successful. In fact, there is also um, a trend going the other way out where we see a lot of people renting cheaper spaces within the market after maybe 5, 10 or even 15 years renting out the same space. So this means that the, the value of space is not only an economical one, uh, a tangible one, but it's also a social construct where the investment is being done primarily based on the potential for added revenue. Taking a perspective even wider, when we start comparing the whole building, we see that the, the total rents for the market in 1658 amounted to around 350 scudi. These increased, uh, over 30 years, these increased to 1,500 uh, scudi. And over a period of 100 years up, uh, from its construction, the, it also increased to 2,400. This is very interesting because when you calculate the proportionality of the, the years with the sum, there is um, an increase. However, the increase is relatively uh, stable and controlled. In the last 30 years, everything changes. And we see that in 1797, a year just before the, Fre uh, the French came to Malta and the Knights had to leave, uh, the value, the total rent value at the market was around 5,000 scudi. So this means that in the last 30 years, the, the prices at the market exploded. This gave us a ratio of around uh, one is to two between the 17th century and the 18th century, which shows that the prices uh, in, the, in the 18th century, at the end of the 18th century, were actually double. This is still a works in progress, primarily because more data is, uh, is necessary. And in fact, this leads me to part, another part of the study, which is comparing the market to the general buildings, commercial buildings within the city. We know, um, as a continuation of the, of the same study, we know that the prices for commercial spaces in other places in Valletta were much cheaper than actually the market itself. This also leads me to 
compare the actual market building with other similar buildings around Valletta. For this part, I took the case study of the Bicceria. However, more research is necessary. We know, however, that when comparing the prices of rents at the market to other uh, places, including um, Bottega at the back of St. John's um, Conventual Church or the Bicceria itself, the prices were twice as much higher. In fact, this is not always uh, related to the actual economical value of a space overlooking uh, a primary uh, street in the city. It also boils down to how people perceive the, the value of that space. The third and final aspect of the study was the social aspect of the market. Well, the research is still in its early stages, um, especially because most of the information obtained from the National Archives was mostly limited to the names. We do have the names of the persons renting out these spaces. However, we don't have their history. So there needs to be a further added level of research, which will add up and give us more information about their stories. And this will require a shift to other archives and start looking into the material. Hopefully something will crop up. However, this, there is already an indication of what to expect. In fact, a recent study by uh, Gian Antonio Scalione um, about a testament by Aloisio Portelli shows that at the market, the choice to stay at the market was not only because of commercial, but also because it was a personal choice. It mostly related to creating networks. In fact, this Alois Portelli was a very rich man who could afford to live anywhere else in Valletta, but he still decided to rent out this one space in the market. The lecture I gave in, uh, in 2019 also allowed me to start exploring a new methodology how to go about studying the market. In fact, the publication, uh, the article published in the book with the same name of the series deals primarily with this topic. To conclude, what have we learned about the market? It is not just a building, but it was also functioning as a center for community networks. Um, it has also been proven that the community valued zoning, not only because there were laws, but because at the end of the day, they were managing to get profits out of these spaces. The study of the market has first and foremost taught me that we cannot look at a building as a definite space, but we have to look even deeper to see how the building was transformed, used, sometimes abused, and what the actual community made sense of the place. I believe it was my privilege to, to work towards a more comprehensive assessment of this building and to discover uh, certain details which practically went unnoticed for 400 years. Hopefully new research in the future will give us more about the social aspect of the building. Hopefully we start seeing how people interacted and maybe not just in the market but also with society externally to the building.